Thanks for coming on Under the Skin, Kahindi yeah. Andrews. We've chatted before. Yep. Uh, since then, you've had a book out, Back to Black. Mm-hmm. And hmm, I, I wonder, like in the last, well, last 18 months, yeah. maybe a lot of things have changed. I don't know if it's been a particularly instructive or important period in, um, hmm, what do we want to call it? I mean, I suppose where, where I'm interested in talking to you, it's, it's Jermaine that we're talking uh, the week after I met with Candice Owens, yeah. who I was sort of bowled over by <laughs> okay. on yeah. a personal level. Yeah. And as I said at the time while speaking with her, disagree with totally yeah. on many, many levels. But uh, in a sense, I wonder if my qualification to disagree with her is, is sufficient. Okay. But you listened to um, my conversation with mm-hmm. Candice Owens, uh, a, yeah. a, a, a proponent of black, conservatism in particular but conservatism yeah. more generally what yeah. what do you think about uh candice owens and her position um it was interesting to hear the position laid out so forcefully but also just to see how much nonsense i've never heard two hours of so much just half truths and then real conclusions that don't make any sense based on the truth so for instance and i think this is why someone like this I'd say dangerous. Really? Because, yeah, because you kind of have some legitimate beefs, right? So, for example, I don't like the government. Government's a problem. Government's not helpful, right? Mm. Um, I also believe in self-help. We should we should organise for ourselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I also think the Democrats in here in the Labour Party haven't really done much for black people. But mm. how you get from that to let's support essentially neoconservatives, Trump, who's clearly racist. Um, capitalists I mean, how do you get from that perspective that we had basically agree on to the complete opposite conclusion that it's all about the individual that it's all about conservative values that it's all about trump and whiteness i that, that for me is dangerous because he's picking up on legitimate gripes that people have and taking them just the completely wrong way i think and i feel like candice was a a huge influence on kanye west's recent political stance and you know uh yeah. well publicized meeting with donald trump so she, she's influential character i mean uh, my assumption is that the her pers- her perspective mm. is gleaned from her personal experience i mean that's yeah. how she it is anecdotal when you speak yeah. to Candace Owens, she says like well you know like i come from this my grandparents come from yeah. uh, a deprivation and we have individually overcome so like it's yeah. a, like that's how i suppose it's uh that's that's i suppose how she reaches those conclusions do, yeah, but, but do you feel that's dangerous well yeah because and also like you said you know we have these platforms now she's very well known um, someone like Kanye West, who you know people look up to, rightly or wrongly, mostly wrongly, if I'm honest. But you know that's a huge platform, and you, when you put these ideas out there, make America great, Trump's the best president. For, I mean, we last time we had this conversation, I said Donald Trump's a better president for black people than Barack Obama. Do you stand by that? Yeah, I stand by that, but I don't think he's a good president for black people. Like, come on. <laughs> if you actually look at his policies, he's appalling. Yeah, so, your point was that Barack yeah. Obama was, there was a kind of a veil in place yeah, exactly, because right. of ethnicity. The, president, the presidency is against black people, whether you've got Barack Obama or Donald Trump. That Again, you can take this kind of critique of Obama, that doesn't mean you end up supporting Trump. And I think this is the po- poverty of political philosophy that the right, and particularly black relatives, have. It's we want to critique things, but we can't see past the political system. So the left has failed us. We have to go for the right. Well, actually, no, there's other answers, right? You don't jump into bed with the devil just because God has failed you, right? I mean, there's there's other ways to go about things. And I think that's what's missing totally from this debate. Well, perhaps it's because it, when you're challenging the framework of political discourse, it often requires new vocabulary mm. it requires a, a kind of legitimate uh critique of the ideas that the mainstream thought is comprised of and like from in your book back to black you talk about like you know black nationalism in the yeah. ain't the answer nation mm. of islam black marxism yeah. so like uh, like and um pan-Africanism, yeah. culturalism, you like a lot of things you talk mm. about as being like one by one, you reject different forms yeah. of black radicalism, mm. even saying I think that Martin Luther King was like a, a agenda to be accepted within a civic society that yeah. essentially despises or, or isn't yeah. beneficial to black people yeah. was uh, like the, the wrong approach. Can you talk us through 
why there is such a need for a new approach to black politics. Well, I think this is important. Again, just to come back briefly to Candice Owens, is that we've kind of stopped doing the hard work intellectually. Like, studying used to be part of organisations. Like, you couldn't be part of the Black Panther Party, for example, or part of the Harambee organisation in the UK, unless you were reading, unless you were discussing things, unless you were having proper, meaningful conversations about the politics. That's been replaced with people like Candice Owens, who just, you know, look at a couple of things on YouTube, read a book, a bit of a book by Milton Friedman, and want to come up and say they've got a political philosophy. And this is what's lacking, right? So when we're looking at what are we trying to go forward, you have to do this work, which is what the book's really about. To say, well, actually, let's try to properly understand what the history of black political thought is, because to be honest, we <laughs> completely and utterly misunderstand it. Um, so, for example, to come to the Martin Luther King point, uh, I'm a big Malcolm X fan. I always talk about Malcolm X. And one of the ways in which Malcolm X is misremembered is that he's a civil rights, um, civil rights figure, which is nonsense. I mean, Malcolm was the biggest critic of the civil rights movement you would ever hear in your entire life. Uh, called Martin Luther King an Uncle Tom, which is probably the worst thing you can call uh, a black person. Um, considering him and King, so Martin Luther King and Malcolm, same, similar age, similar time, doing similar-ish things, you'd think they would have had met at least a few times. They met once because their politics were so completely different. Uh, King represents that kind of civil rights let's integrate into the system, let's, you know, try and, we need white people to su support with white people, so we have to be all hands, hold hands, and et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Malcolm's the black radical tradition, which is, bone all of that, forget, forget all of that. Actually, what we need is revolution, what we need is self-help, what we need is a completely different political system. Right? Do you think that might be to a degree, because Martin Luther King was obviously a Christian minister, and mm. his philosophy would ultimately be derived from spiritual and scriptural tradition, and Malcolm... X is coming from like to a degree nation, mm. but in later life Islam yeah. more traditionally. What what do you think are the the religious influences on both of their positions? Um, well, I think early on, so nation of Islam, and I do talk a lot about nation of Islam in the book, uh, is a version of Islam, but it's a version of Islam which is black separatist, and you know embedded in it says that we don't need white people. So I think actually that is quite a big reason why Malcolm early on is like you know just forget white people, right? Because that's what it says in in the nation of Islam. But then when he converts to Sunni Muslim, to Sunni Islam, I mean, that's, honestly, Islam and Christianity are very similar. They have very similar beliefs. They have very similar tenets. They're about peace. Um, but his philosophy doesn't change when he changes, when he moves into that more, a, a religion where he would say he's more accepting everybody, et cetera, et cetera. He still holds on to his black radical beliefs. So I don't think it's just because King's a Christian, although I think that influences it, but I think it's more the... What's the what, what politics do you believe in? Because if you look back at the history of some of the most um, violent rebellions against slavery, they were Christian preachers. Same book that Martin Luther King's reading, and they're saying, let's um, you know, let's burn it down. So there is a Christian philosophy which would say we still need to burn it down because this is not going to work for us. You don't believe then there is any integrated any possibility of integrated freedom for black people because the thing that black people would be integrated into is a system that oppresses them and is it not possible to create new superstructures mm. that could be free and i, I emphasize new superstructures <laughs> that could, will be free from the kind of racial prejudice and bias that uh the underwrite oppression uh this system can no more provide freedom justice and equality than a chicken can lay a duck egg that's Malcolm X, right? I mean, we have to understand that this, the, what, what we live in today is built 100% on the oppression of black and brown people. I mean, actually, the book I'm currently writing, actually, The West is Built on Racism, kind of outlines... That's the exactly, title. That is the, that is the working, <laughs> working title. It it's might catchy. Change. Working title, you never know. But um, if you actually look historically, what makes the West the West? It's finding the Americas. Uh, it's a genocide of tens of millions of people, followed by slavery, which killed tens of millions of people, followed by colonialism, which killed probably hundreds of millions of people, um, all black and brown people. And so what you have to understand is that when we're looking at the inequalities today and a child dies every 10 seconds because they have no access to food, all of those children are black and brown. Uh, the, the logic of the system is racism. So how could you ever possibly expect within this what we currently have to have equality? It's, not, it's, it's literally impossible. Right? You think that's the defining uh, modality of uh, not only Western imperialism, but power is racism. Like, mm. because it feels to me, because obviously I'm a white person, so 
Like, um, <laughs> like I look for different <laughs> narratives because <laughs> otherwise I'm in the baddies. <laughs> like, I don't want to be in the baddies. Yeah. Uh, like, so, like, and also, like, that's it's just the the thing is, like, I feel, and probably a lot of white people will be disheartened at yeah. the implication that there is that that the are you saying that the only solutions are sort of separatist or sectarian solutions? Uh, no, like you, there are other. Look, I'm, what I'm saying is the only solution is revolution. You've had Marxism, right? Communism, which suggests that capitalism needs to end, which would also be revolution. Uh, potentially, that could erase racism. What I'm trying to say is, I just don't. You can't trust people in the West, and that includes black people in the West and Asian people in the West. But obviously, it's mostly white people. You can't trust mm. people who live, who benefit off a system which oppresses and kills black and brown people to end that system. So if we want to end it, we have to end it ourselves. That's why that's the argument for black radicalism. As black people f- thrive and flourish, not in, uh, you know, sort of proportional, uh, like not, not proportionally, but to a degree, you know, like there is a, 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 a members of the elite that are black. Yeah. There are There is a black middle class. Mm-hmm. As they integrate into these structures is there a central blackness uh compromised is there an essential blackness to which you refer and what uh, when you talk about revolution Mm -hmm. what do you mean so i think to go back to candace always i think you can see very clearly that there's a central blackness which is compromised right i mean one of the concepts I talk about in the book actually is uh, psychosis of whiteness, right? So actually one of the whiteness has been a, a set of ideas that's so delusional because we have to protect ourselves. And when I say we, I mean we, very generally. We have to protect ourselves from the reality that we live off dead children. That is what makes us wealthy today. This this is the system which which feeds us. So we have to have this kind of delusional idea. Whiteness, you kind of can't reason with it. And the best... The uh, the best example of the psychosis of whiteness I've heard for a long time was Candace Owens sitting in this chair last week talking completely contradictory about everything doesn't make sense wrapped around in a in a bubble and you when you try to talk to her and explain just simple things and it's just like you're talking to yourself right and so that's what happens to us when we integrate into these systems we just become the same that's why whiteness isn't just for white people whiteness is that idea that philosophy that protects this system and unfortunately many of us now in the west uh black and brown people in the west um also engage in it so that that does i think that that does take away from our, our blackness as a political ideology if the these categories are shifting like categories of even ethnicity are shifting beyond you know, like their beyond their biological beyond biology mm-hmm. that there are people that you could term as white that are black yeah. i don't know about vice versa i've seen that documentary <laughs> no one comes out of that with any credit <laughs> like um like i feel like um how like how do you how do you galvanize people behind a revolution when it's the, the sort of the when i want to say when the qualification for it is kind of is, is shifting who is it that we're t- trying to reach i understand that historically the wealth of western nations is mm-hmm. built on colonization mm-hmm. slavery i i understand that you know yeah. probably people that are sort of uh, uh, like a believing empire and believing yeah. nation will say no it's built on innovation and ingenuity yeah. and technology and that's part of the story but also there's a lot of oppression and a lot of <laughs> yeah, death lot. as well yeah, a lot. yeah quite a lot yeah <laughs> there's quite a lot of that so there's a lot of it that's gone on yeah. but how do you think how do you propose to like? I know, how do you propose to reach out and bring people together yeah. a, a, around an idea of dismantling these structures? And what is it we'd look to replace it with? I'm glad to be the person asking that question <laughs> yeah, for a change instead of having to answer. Yeah, um, well, I think one. I think when we think about, and it's again part of what the book is: what is blackness? That hasn't changed. That's been steady for centuries what is blackness blackness is an identity that says that because we are from africa and i look like this because i'm descended from africa uh, that puts me into a category of other people who are descendants of africa and now importantly because we're descendants of africa one of the things the west does is racial hierarchy has black people at the bottom and white people at the top now that hasn't changed look at the where's the poorest continent in the world is africa the richest countries in the world are all with the white people live right so you actually have racial hierarchy so this isn't something that just happened in the past this is something that is still happening today and what blackness is blackness is is called into being because we recognize that 
we are oppressed within the system partly we also recognize that we are connected together we're, we're what we call the global black nation so what's being asked for or what the call is to unite people is unite around that understand that you can never because we're black we will never have freedom or equality within these systems and we have a responsibility to all other people who are black and they're doing far worse than us as well so our problems here are bad but our problems elsewhere are far worse. So of those child that dies every 10 seconds because they have no access to food, at least 60% are, are in Africa, right? Three million children die in Southeast Africa every year for no reason at all, right? That's the political project that black radicalism is calling us to unite around. And I don't see why that would turn people off. I think that's something that if we understand our history, our location and where we're trying to go, that should be something that brings us together. Why would that be a call that you would specifically make to black people that now may personally identify as Swedish or French <laughs> or American and do you yeah. think that's risible to do you like no, uh, I mean, why I, not I, white yeah. people why shouldn't white people care about no every the, look I don't worry everybody should care like lots of children die it's not just black children uh, and it's problem and we should all care but the reality is uh, materially there's no and this is this is I guess this is, this is the point right if you look at my my actual material location in this world, there's absolutely no reason why I should give one damn about those dead children. In fact, I have what I have because they did. That's the way capitalism works. So all of us here, whether it's Sweden, British, America, etc., all of us benefit from it. So it's kind of, it's just not like me trying to convince everybody that, hey, we should look at this. It's not going to happen. That's not how these things work, right? What I am saying, though, is because of our particular history of blackness, and our particular experience of it here. So we're not going to get full equality here anyway. So the way that we're treated badly here, police brutality, poverty, racism in schools, is related to the same reason why those children die. So actually, our position is a bit different because we're black. Um, and then also, I guess I'm arguing that we should elevate beyond our material position. I'm, I, it's, I, I look like these children. Like, this is matters. Like, you know what I'm saying? When you turn on the TV and you see those... Um, starving kids with the big bellies that could be my son so that should actually elevate me beyond my actual location to say actually this is my political project and i just think maybe everybody should care but it's a bit less likely that everybody's gonna engage in that there's two things Kahindi, that makes me think one is that the fact that there is a sort of a like a, an apparent physical resemblance between uh, black people like that you know it's not shared by japanese people or <laughs> caucasian people that yeah. that sh it should be a meaningful connection mm -hmm. and that we can't push that to be, be uh, like a, a total that our ambition yeah. ought not be a total brotherhood or fraternity mm -hmm. or we'll call it we will of all human beings for me that it uh, troubles me again okay. because I'm a white person, okay. and like uh, maybe if I was a black person, I'd be like, yeah, this is, seems like a good point <laughs> yeah. to step off. <laughs> um, but then uh, the other thing is, is that it feels to me that what you're saying, it, in a way, that this transcendent mm -hmm. idea of blackness yeah. is a spiritual idea that to mm -hmm. overcome and reject your material position yeah. in favour for an ideal that is mm -hmm. uh, built upon a kind of uh, a whole. Uh, a, a whole and uh, yeah I say transcendent yeah. idea of blackness that that should be at the core mm -hmm. of, of the black experience yeah. wherever you are in the world as a black person uh, yeah actually I was talking to you last time that gave me this kind of argument right oh. uh, I was just at a conference I thought I was an influential yeah, no, black did. thinker actually changed, changed the way that <laughs> I, about I was at a conference last, last week the politics of love at Oxford University which was interesting for many reasons, um, <laughs> but but, but uh, it is kind. Of, this is uh, Huey P. Newton, Elaine Brand, the Black Panther Party. They talked about um, a revolutionary love for the people, and actually, that is more than anything what we're talking about. It's not about hatred or not liking white people. It's about understanding our history and our location. Look, I'm black, like that. Physical thing's important because I'm not black for no reason. Like I'm black for a reason. You can't explain the history, my present current location without the history of Africa etc so I, it's a real connection historical connection and it's about saying well actually a love for all of us the diaspora uh, takes us to a different level politically because we can't just stick about what's happening in Britain or black professors or all that stuff we actually have to talk about the real problems in the world which are children die regularly and so it is it is actually a transcendent I think I think at least it should be transcendent yes. it doesn't have to be like what's the other thing black, I'm not saying you have to like I, in fact, there's more 
logical reasons for people to be like more like Candace Owens than more revolutionary. Like you're just being rational, right? You're making yeah. rational choices. But actually what I'm saying is we're better than that and we should be better than that and we should elevate beyond that. Because that is, a, in a sense, you're making an appeal to invisible ideas and, and as you, to use your, your words, ideas that are not entirely rational. Right. But Candace Owens' position of, well, you live in America. America is a land of opportunity. Yeah. Slavery is not happening now. And if you as an individual want to sort of forget Jim Crow and just plow onwards <laughs> yeah, exactly. with your yeah. gumption... Yeah. you're gonna do yeah, that's, fine that's, that's the that's rational that's the rational thing that makes sense right but and i think it goes back to the spiritual if you look at um african traditions african systems and beliefs what's really important is the ancestors the dead the dead are with us and they don't leave us and so actually that kind of ancestral connection is really really important so when i say we're connected to africa if you take it from a spiritual perspective we're actually, actually properly connected our ancestors that's that's us and in a way to go against that goes against you spiritually you are then referring to an idea of latent, inhered, indigenous faith. An idea of like pre-Christian, African, you know, I don't know, pagan belief in <laughs> yeah. the ancestor and our relationship within one, with, to one another as a whole. Yeah. But this is something that should be honoured. Yeah, no, it's a Europe. It's a very European idea that the past is the past, and the past is dead, and it's, it's gone, and it's disappeared. I think you find most traditional religions, or not not religions, traditional beliefs, hold on to the idea that the past, the future, and the present are kind of a lot more closer than we think. Mm -hmm. So you can't this linear explanation is, is nonsense, and that's part. That's partly the if, you, if you're going to have a spirituality of blackness, that's it, right? Progressivism, in a sense, the being what like like a. a, a a sort of as if there is a teleology to technology mm. to materialism to consumerism that we are progressing we are going forward yeah. i mean even sort of christianity which in this sort of its protestant form is the sort of the uh, uh, the sort of ideological template for um, our secular societies shall we say <laughs> even there the idea of the father yeah. and us coming from the father is a sort of a, 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 a defining determining idea but uh, yeah. uh, but only perhaps at the expense of the individual and the progress of the individual yeah. and the power of the individual so when you're like uh, when you're writing uh, uh, Back to Black or your next book, The West is Bastards or whatever, it, or whatever it's called, like what what is the campaign that uh, you like? How, what do you think? Uh, you know, black people. Not, I'm going to mm -hmm. say young black people in this country, but you know, forget those categories because you're sort of saying that they're irrelevant. That the idea of nation is part of the oppressive. In, uh, pro, uh, pro, the oppressive structures that prevent yeah. black people achieving freedom so if you're a black person anywhere what are the campaigns that you'll be getting behind are you talking about sort of philanthropic campaigns to help uh, African kids that are being yeah. you know killed as a result of you know, sort of capitalism lack of resources yeah. etc because of the IMF or yeah. however you see it what do you think what is the campaign or action mm. should uh, I have to say they because <laughs> I'm not a black person be yeah. behind um, so what I think well, I mean, caveat, just because something's not radical, it doesn't mean it's not a good idea. And if you look at most black politics, they focus on the symptoms. So, for example, children dying is a symptom. Mm. Police brutality is a symptom. And actually, all of our politics is about the symptoms. How do we fix this particular symptom? Um, now, the symptoms kill us. So, actually, you have to treat the symptoms or it'll die, right? So, I, w I don't want to say opening an orphanage or giving money to isn't, isn't a good thing because, of course, it's a good thing. You should do that. That's important. But we also have to recognise that if you don't treat the actual disease, then the symptoms will carry on endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. And this is the this is the cycle we've been trapped in, treating the symptoms and not the disease. Mm. And the disease is simple. It is the political and economic system. So therefore, we need to have not a campaign, but a movement, what we call a revolution, right, <laughs> to, to overturn the political and economic system. And I think that's what we haven't done, really. So what the book really is, kind of theoretical, but also trying to make a, a case for what we should do. And what we should do is build... Um, an organization, an organization, a mass organization across what we call the global black nation uh, that include, that forget British, American, whatever, just across everywhere that really links us together properly, that builds that those connections properly. Um, and that once you have that organization, which well, isn't simple, that's where you have true political power. And then you can start to say, well, actually, how do we do things differently? And it sounds a little bit utopian, but 100 years ago, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, as started by Marcus Garvey, Amy Jakes Garvey, uh, later on as well, had an organization that was 5 million members across 50 countries. I mean, this is before 
the telephones even really used. Forget internet, forget Twitter and all that. Five million people a hundred years ago is probably like 20 million people today. It's a mass organization. So, and it wasn't 100% radical in many ways. It was a bit capitalist. It was a bit bougie in some ways. But the mechanism was there. And if they can get together, five million people across 50 countries with no communication, what is stopping us from doing something bigger than that and building the global black nation as a real thing? I would, the answer would be that perhaps oppression was less insidious and mm -hmm. more vivid yeah. then, and therefore it was probably easier to frame uh, the objectives of such yeah. a movement and in terms of equality yeah. whereas under the terms of your argument Kahindi equality itself is being determined yes. by what is afforded to yeah. e.g. white citizens <laughs> and is therefore systemically tainted in a way you are talking about revolution in, in the most radical terms in the sense of like the uh, uh, end of convent our conventional understanding of nation mm -hmm. and how we arrived at nation yeah. nation in its m modern form yeah. as uh, you know the, the sharing the spoils of colonialism exactly. we spoke last time about reparations yeah. and like i was quite struck by how the reparation argument helps us to see that what we uh, take for granted as nation in in a vivid and contemporary sense mm. is the manifestation of the oppression yeah. uh, and genocides yeah. of, of the past. But how do we mobilise uh, people to participate in what it's hard not to conceive of as their own destruction, regardless of if you are <laughs> black or white, because... Yeah. You know, I don't even, I think sort of the people with most to gain, say yeah. that you are a member of the urban underclass in any UK city and you're yeah. black, mm -hmm. it still might be hard to wrap your head around, let's get rid of the idea of nation. Is it hard? <laughs> I think okay, on that level of let's get rid of the idea of nation, yes, probably you're not going to get many people say, yeah, it's a great idea. But in terms of the actual practicalities of the, what does that mean? So what does that mean? And I think this is where the Black Panther Party is instructive. So, you know, revolutionary organization, they believed in revolution and end of capitalism. But what did they actually do? They provided free food. They provided free health care. They had a newspaper. They had le free legal advice. They actually dealt with the symptoms as well. And oh. so any movement has to do that, has to deal with the problems that people face locally. Because no one's just going to jump on board and say, let's end capitalism. You have to build a... And that, again, where part of this love comes in. How do you care for people? How do you bring people in? How do you create a movement which is caring? And in doing that, then people come along and come on board with the with the revolution. It's the only way. It's the only real way to do it. It's not just an abstract. Let's go end capitalism. You have to build the community first. How do you propose to do that? Uh, so like I said we started. So the book makes this, this argument for the Hirambi organization, the Black Unity. Uh, there's a website, blackunity.org.uk. Uh, we just started it in Birmingham. So one of the again to quote Malcolm X again, not even quote, but. Malcolm basically takes the Garvey movement, which was problematic in many ways, and radicalizes it. So starts the organization of Afro-American unity in 1964, which hardly anybody's ever heard of, which is strange because you know, Malcolm X is one of the most famous people of the 20th century, was working on this when he died, isn't included in his autobiography, isn't included in the film about him, isn't included in much written about him, which is odd, right? The reason I'd argue that's why is because it's basically the solution. It's just, this is an actual revolutionary mechanism. And the way the organization works is essentially like a government. So you have a department of education, of health, of business, etc. Uh, people pay a proper rate, like like tax. Uh, but it's this, it's this, we decide what we do with that money and we do things differently and it creates a level of independence. Wow. Would you be... A, a, a Ideally, you'd be exempted from any other forms of taxation. So you would say, "Well, I'm no longer part of <laughs> well, England or America or Finland. Well, ideally, I pay my tax to this yeah. this operation." Ideally, but I doubt that's going to happen. Right? Like, this would be realistic. Yeah. But yeah, no, ideally. But I mean, on a basic level, and this is actually they take they take their model from the church. This is how the black church works. Tithe in tithe, right? You tithe ten percent for heaven. Why don't you tithe ten percent for your actual community right um and imagine if you have what if you have this and you have chapters in birmingham in manchester in kingston in kinshasa and you build all those together then you have a massive revolutionary potentially revolutionary organization which doesn't have any national borders because the national borders have disappeared which has political agenda which has a local agenda and if that's what we're trying to do for the next give it a few years hopefully the next 10 years we'll have built a 
massive organization that goes across the globe that can then talk about revolution really because at the minute it's like theoretical yeah. if you build this organization it's not theory it's possible because i think that some of the challenges are that any centralized organization is so immediately beset with uh, <coughs> sectarianism and infighting it becomes so complex and the initial challenges of addressing symptoms are so significant even if you were to take on something like how do we protect young black members of like citizens from legal disputes or mm. police brutality or negative uh, the impact of negative stereotypes or <laughs> yeah. you know, like that, that, that there's, 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 it's so fractured and fragmented the issues that yeah. it's hard to in a sense be global yes. in, to, uh, to have a global yeah. vision because we are all mired like you know to talk about see you know, like a, a sm smaller component of identity politics to which I personally belong, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, the community of recovering addicts, okay. right? Yeah. I like just come from a meeting with organization that believe in abstinence-based mm. recovery as opposed to harm reduction, meaning okay. like that the goal for anyone that's got an addiction issue is you've got to, get, you've got to be clean from all substances, not on some okay. sort of methadone subscription or whatever. Okay. And that given that like harm reduction is easier for the government to fund because as soon as someone's on a methadone script, they're dealt with, yeah. whereas putting someone through six to 12 to <coughs> 18 weeks of yeah. tr residential treatment is much more money, no guarantee of a positive outcome. You know, so like... To create like organizations built around a simple idea where you sort of self identify mm. as an addict, mm. it's still very hard to uh, get these various views to congeal and come together. You know, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. like how you do it with something as potentially enormous as a sort of a, a global black unit is difficult. <laughs> but like, but given that I'm an optimist and given that <laughs> that, that, that what was currently in place. <laughs> yeah isn't working you know for i would you know of course again from my perspective it's perhaps determined on economic and spiritual lines the you know like the vast majority of people are in my opinion living substandard lives without access to the resources mm -hmm. emotional spiritual yeah. material mm -hmm. that they're entitled to and there's no reason for this like yeah. degree of suffering when there is the affluence and abundance that we have on the planet like how what kind of what in Malcolm X's uh, original idea of African American mm. unity is that mm. what it was called? Yeah. Like, and your version of uh, uh, black unity across yeah. the planet. What is the relationship between an organisation such that as that and white people that uh, don't feel like no, my role is to crush this black unity movement <laughs> 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 and, and ensure that uh, um, white systems yeah. remain in power? How do you reach out in fellowship yeah. with the yeah. many, many vast majority? Because <laughs> yeah. it's only a tiny percentage of anybody that's yeah. basically benefiting, isn't it? You know, yeah. like. Isn't it? I mean, well, we're doing right. better than them kids that are <laughs> exactly. dead mining for copper or whatever. Exactly. I mean, I guess for black radicalism, the audience is slightly different because to address that question of how do you how do you keep it radical, the only way to do that, um, and actually, what Malcolm wanted to do was the OAAU was supposed to be linked to the Organization of African Unity on the African continent. And the only real way to keep it honest is to have the people, the wretched of the earth, who look, all of us benefit, even the poorest black person in this country, their kid's not going to die because they haven't got food, right? Like, you're just not. Like, it's better to be poor here than it is to be poor in the Congo. So all of us benefit to some level, even though we're massively discriminated against here as well. So the only way to keep it honest is to have the people who are really, really suffering, the, po the poorest people. So from the very offset, it can't be a Western thing where it's just we get together and talk about stuff because that will very quickly turn into an integration club. <laughs> it has to be, how do you reach out to the African continent? So one of the things we did last couple of weeks, we we had a conference at Birmingham City University where we re-engaging Pan-Africanism. We brought speakers from South Africa and Nigeria, um, South Africa and Ghana. Uh, we're hoping to do a, a major conference in Ghana in three years, where we can actually connect these things together. Because I think once you start to hear what's actually happening to people, I think it changes your whole mentality. Like, I don't want, like, for example, let's take black professors, for example. This is a big thing at the minute in the UK. There's a lack of black professors and everybody's moaning about it and we need more black professors. And of course we do, right? I just became a professor, so. Congratulations. Is it? No. <laughs> I mean, on becoming a black thank professor. You. Thank you. But is it? Is it? Is it? I don't, we had a whole three hour class with the, with the class about whether this is even something to celebrate, right? Right, because you would argue, oh, well, then you've just become systemized. Yeah, what does that mean, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a bigger point. Like, I can spend my time arguing for more black professors or I can spend my time saying there's three million children that die in Southeast Africa every year and how do we fix that? And actually, those two things are 
diametrically opposed anyway. So I think once you <laughs> once we start to understand what the real problems are, then I think that shifts our mentality. I don't believe in this stuff just because I believe it. I believe in it because I understand that the thing works. Right? What is your personal experience? I understand what you're saying in terms of your identity as a black man, mm-hmm. but what is your personal and emotional connection to this suffering and oppression? What is it that has affected you? Is it academic, intellectual and cultural? Or is something rooted itself in you that hasn't in a lot of uh, Western, Anglophonic black people? No, I think it does. I think, I think it, it does in most people. I think actually, when I, that's one of the things about talking about the book, going around having these conversations. I've been surprised. There's the range of people who've been engaged and surprised the hell out of me. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Like people in the banking sector, people who I never would have thought would have been interested at all. Um, on reading they're like okay well I never thought about it like that I never you know because the way our school system is the way our media is the way everything is it's all about Britain 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 and we've kind of lost that global focus and when you look at it I don't know it's obvious isn't it it seems obvious to me that the real struggle isn't here the real struggle is elsewhere I and agree I, just so. in terms of prioritising <laughs> yeah. like it's sort of like it's more important I think this when you see arguments about film stars of different yeah. genders get in less money or whatever i think you know that's a bit like the black professor yeah. argument it's like well what is where well, i wonder i said implicit in what you are saying kahindi is that if we were to turn our focus mm. to the i mean again it is the symptoms but like you know like it, the most egregious symptoms of you know oppression mm. racism yeah. that do you think that that in, would just somehow create a shift if instead of thinking about um you know like sort of within a national context uh, a representation under representation if we said look let's just solely focus on trying to not have impoverished children yeah. like you know do you think that, that yeah. would... i mean that'd be a basically good principle and this is the problem <laughs> with the left in general right like the left always hear corbyn left marx even Mar- communist marxist so, uh, socialist workers party always focusing on what's happening in britain uh, this, this not the working class struggle is not really taking place here. It's taking place in factories in Asia, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the problem. That's where the proletariat is. They, they, they in Dunstable, wherever. So I think there's a general principle. If we looked where the real oppression is, who has it the worst, and we focused our politics there, that would probably be a good route to some more revolutionary solutions. That really. requires such a change ideologically. In a sense, like whilst what uh, Candice Owens, who on a personal level I must reiterate, I got on very well with. <laughs> Like what what she's saying doesn't require a particularly radical shift because the sort of the heritage of that ideology yeah. is in place and the systems that perpetuate it are in place. But to to say why don't we put aside our concerns about Brexit or no Brexit yeah. and focus instead on the serious, say, you know, humanitarian and ecological issues that mm-hmm. are ha- most are having an impact now. Like yeah. if we take in our own lives, the mo- the worst thing that could happen to me would be something to happen to one of my children. Yeah. Well, that is happening to yeah. other people's children. Mm. So let's prioritize that. Yeah. You know, that for that to happen, I have to subjugate my obsession with my own life goals yeah. and my own sense of who I am as a man yeah. and what my role is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what my objectives are yeah. uh, that those things would have to be put yeah. aside and that and typically traditionally at least you're proposing that that could be achieved through a, a kind of identification with your race and with your heritage that people could put aside their individual identity their national mm-hmm. identity their identity as a West Ham fan or an Aston Villa fan <laughs> or whatever it is or a vegetarian <laughs> and like instead go no I come from here and I'm the same as these kids that are, and I'm saying yeah. that the only way that's been achieved yeah. and, and the only way I can almost understand of it has yeah. been achieved is a literal uh, symbol of transcendence as achieved through the religion. spirit and yeah, religion I mean, yeah. yeah I mean I don't know I mean I think that Historically, we've seen it. I think we see it even with things like Black Lives Matter. I think you see it. I think we're seeing a more emergence of it now. And also, the other thing that makes us different, this is for black people different, is that we cannot get freedom and equality in this system. Like, even, geez, even me, Mr. Black Professor, I get racism every single day. Like, oh, gee, of course. Like, so there's, we understand there is a limit 
to where we're going here, right? I know that my kids are going to struggle, even though I sh- they shouldn't. They're going to have far more of a struggle than they should do uh, based on their economic position. So I think that's what that's the other thing, which is the real, real solution, the real situation that we find ourselves in, is that it isn't difficult to connect what's happening in Africa to what's happening in Hansworth in Birmingham. We can connect those things very simply. And so I think because of that, and I think you're seeing that with young people, why young people are out in the streets, why young people are, are dissatisfied, um, even while they're claiming Britishness, like they, they, it's like everybody's surprised. Uh, this is what always gets me is like, I don't know why anybody's surprised that we get treated badly as black people. So, for example, the Windrush crisis, everyone's like, oh, they treated us so bad. Like, what do you expect? Like, I mean, that's, that's Britain. That is your historical relationship to this country. You have a passport, you could be, it don't matter, you could be born here. People who were born here get treated like second class citizens. So, regardless, people get were born outside. But I think because these things are happening, because people are starting to realize that you actually have a, a material reason why black people would join. It's not just about faith and hope. It's about actually people understand that they're not going to have equality. And so we need something different. But that equality and this idea of equality is it's hard. I would I would submit to make a tangible to the point where it's worth making the kind of sacrifice that that might demand beyond the theoretical stage that to prioritize the global black experience mm-hmm. above your experience yeah. as an individual yeah, yeah, yeah. is such a, a huge ideological leap which Can, is, yeah which is why i think the you have to deal with the symptoms where i said you still if you had this local organizations they're still dealing with those issues i'm not saying don't deal with the symptoms don't worry about the black kids who are getting bullied or not in, doing well in school or police brutality you've got to deal with them or nobody will come with you no one's going to jump on board for the global revolution. Revolution happens at home, right? It starts in the community. So I 100% agree. You have to have a politics that can do both. So you feel that that there is a deeper affinity, a gene DNA deep okay. affinity between black people that trumps any other type of interpersonal affinity that could be achieved. Even if that black person has... In, entirely become uh, systemized and is entirely existing you know like in a sense uh, right do mm-hmm. you you have more sisterhood <laughs> with candace owens no. as a black woman <laughs> than me as a white man because candace owens is ultimately at essence f- like you from africa a product of colonization and oppression yeah. and i am a white man ultimately in a position to benefit from these systems and am benefiting from these systems. Uh, there was a saying, what was it? Stokely Carmichael became Kwame Touré said, every Negro is a potential black person, which after having here in Candice Owens, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure we can keep that. <laughs> but no, I think, no, like, I'm not making, it's not, it's, a gen- no, it's not like a genetic thing. It's a, I guess on some level we're saying it's hereditary, right? Black, this means something that connects you historically. But I'm not saying that all black people will agree with that. All, all black people have to agree with that, right? Candace Owens is, as far as I'm concerned, she's gone. So we, me and you have far more affinity than she's, she's off on that plantation. She's off on the plantation somewhere. Like, we can, we don't have to take everybody, right? And it, it really is more about politics. Do you engage in this politics or not? Many people won't engage. Some people will. But what I would say, though, is, and this is also from history, is that people tend to get on board. People in my position tend to get on board when they don't really have a choice. So mm-hmm. if you look at the Haitian Revolution, for example, that we remember Toussaint Louverture, who kind of led the revolution eventually, but he didn't get involved at first. He was a free, he'd been, he'd been freed, he was a slave, but he was free. He actually owned slaves in Haiti. And when the revolution started, started by the grassroots, the underclass, um, he didn't want to know. He's like, that's nothing to do with me. <laughs> what the <don't, laughs> fuck am I doing? And you also had the mixed race class who they called the mulattoes, who were free and had some, clo- had some power in the, in the colonial order. At the start of the revolution, they didn't want to know either. It was only when the the enslaved had pushed it to a point where it's either, look, you join us or you're with them. Then all of a sudden, Tucson came on board, everybody came on board. And I think that's probably a similar process that we'd have to go through. You don't mm-hmm. need everybody to start with, but eventually people come on board. Right? What about uh, July, June? And the, like, mm-hmm. what do you feel like uh, come, uh, some of these mass protest <laughs> movements that seem at least from the outside as yet to be politically indeterminate in the conventional sense but i've seen both people on the right and left yeah. claim like uh, this populist french movement as their own french politics as we know is beset with uh, post-colonial conflict and oppositionism yeah. and like you know like paris has been like a like yeah. hotbed yeah. <laughs> of uh, uh, sort of racial yeah, yeah. and anti-Islamic mm-hmm. and te- you know sentiment and terrorism. Let's like, say so what, what 
this is though interesting to me mm. to see in this uh, this this fractured time, which most easily it seems yields territory to the right, at least on the evidence yeah. of recent elections. Yeah. Um, it seems that this is uh you know we're going to start to see that the right wing ultimately we're going to see that right wing politics won't work for ordinary people yeah. of any color. Yeah, you know, yeah. Presumably that would be more pronounced for uh, non-white people. So what do you feel about the gilets jaunes? And do you see that there's anything, or is this again? Would you say just the struggle taking place within a colonial framework? Even though to me it seems like a sort of a, a quite a sort of a primal attempt to sort of really challenge structures. Um, it could be. I mean, I think it's it's one of those where. Again, similar with Black Lives Matter, you see that there's a the urgency there, and the, the people understand that things are terrible and things need to fundamentally change. Um, but it needs, it needs organizing, it needs politics. Otherwise, it's, it's just anger, and it doesn't necessarily get you anywhere. And it can equally go to the right, as it can go to the left. And I think I'm not, I'm not sure what the politics of it is. It seems a bit. Rea- France is a bit like that. They're a bit reactionary, right? Something happens and they react. And, it's, uh, and then they go back. Set fire to a lorry. <laughs> exactly. Right? But you need more than that. You need. That's part of the reason why I wrote the book, right? Uh, what's the political ideology which we are going with and actually radicalism doesn't necessarily mean protest or industry or violence radicalism means going down a particular political agenda so i think uh, being in the street and protesting the rising gas prices it could be the start of something but there's not necessarily anything more to it than that right certainly like perhaps um you know like occupy mm-hmm. uh, uh, it, it when people are on the streets for me that is like like you were saying about that haitian revolution that is the point where people are willing to go okay this is affecting me now so <laughs> like, I'm, I'm coming out i'm sticking the, the yellow vest on um you know like individualism is a whilst it's not ex, well i suppose it is explicitly part of the american dream for example mm-hmm. and it's explicitly part of protestantism so yeah perhaps it is explicitly part of our sort of cultural or national ideology yeah. i feel like it's a very difficult thing to overwhelm in that it inhabits your body like you know i know that I, you know at least i feel like i know that i yeah. am me and these yeah. are, that's my hunger and mm-hmm. that's my sexual desire and that's yeah. my anger mm-hmm. um for me to be able to redirect my personal impulses to causes that not only don't benefit me but could mm-hmm. possibly on a material level be to my detriment mm-hmm. requires a certain degree of faith and that faith that's not a easy thing to come by. That's a hard thing for people. Maybe different if you are, you know, but you are presumably, you know, you're in a pretty good position. Your kids are probably in a good position. You've got a good job. You're respected. You're a member of your community with a degree of power, etc. So what sacrifices are you willing to make? <laughs> we have this conversation a lot, actually, in our Black Studies. Do you? Through the Black Studies degree. And there are, I'm always saying, at like, Birmingham. at Birmingham City University, and I'm always saying, like, I'm not radical. They're like, what do you mean? You know, you must be radical. You wrote the book on radicalism. You must be radical. And I'm saying, well, if I was radical, I wouldn't be in this job. Mm. Professor is not a radical <laughs> occupation. I've said that what we need to do is start an organization, the Rambi Organization of Black Unity. And the sacrifice I should do is I should go and do that. Why am I in this job? Just go and leave. But obviously, I've got a mortgage. I've got four kids. <laughs> it's not that simple, right? So even on my personal level, you still I understand the need to say, actually, look, I've got me and my family. You have to provide for that. And how do we, and you, people don't just sacrifice stuff for the faith and this is going to happen. Um, but I think, but I think also, I think that actually one of the reasons why I do think, sorry, about the issue of we're more human than you like to think. I think actually people feel worse about the conditions of the world than we often give them credit for. For example, why is whiteness a psychosis? Why do I say it's a psychosis? Because it's a protective mechanism because if we actually were to address the real situation in the world, it, you know, with everybody would just collapse, right? Yeah. So as much so, so even Candice Owens, like she's why is she so fervent in her ridiculously delusional beliefs? Because deep down she knows she knows she she has to protect herself because actually to acknowledge the actual reality of what race is in just just America, just just America, forget the rest of the world, that would completely not only destroy her location she's given she has her job and her platform because she's a right wing well what did i say before the the 
blackface on white racism right? I mean that, that's her job right yeah I didn't say that to her <laughs> so you didn't say it, yeah. no mate no. I didn't say would've that got, would have gone down well I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you know but so deep so on some level she... I think if you met her she's charming that's what I'll say to you yeah. he's like you know but in a sense look in a way we all got our politics <laughs> haven't we but like you say and like you know both of us here we are both of us with our radical beliefs ultimately admitting that when it comes to it I've got to look after my daughters you've mm. got to look after your four kids you know and it's like a lot more pressure has got to be exerted on me before I'm like that's it I'm out there now I'm putting on the yellow vest I'm picking <laughs> yeah, up whatever I need to yeah. pick up yeah but that's why we have to create the re- we have to create conditions where you can have so for example I keep talking about the organisation I would like to think in 10 years or 5, 10 years at least it's to a point where I can leave my job and be maybe not as comfortable as I currently am but comfortable I need to be wealthy I just need to be able to pay the bills and feed the kids right so and I think that's possible if we do the right things and I think if you if you gave people that option I think they'd be fine with it Deep down if we believed that by living by our principles we would be happier like the one I always think is what if I instead of going hey there shouldn't be homeless people I just like when it like I just right come on this room in this office we could have homeless people sleeping in here we'd have homeless people in our spare room right let's start <coughs> living by this stuff i part of me thinks i would be eventually happier like you know, once i got past that oh, bloody hell they've used my shampoo <laughs> like, once i got past that, well, the toilet's blocked who done that right like, well, like uh, I'd, I'd eventually be happier but it requires a sort of faith it requires that i reach inside myself now like a person that's sort of like what they would call themselves either a conservative or right wing mm. or they would say i'm a realist i don't know how they would describe themselves but they're not faced with that challenge because they can say no i'm mm. living the life that i say i'm living yeah, yeah. and you are as well yeah, you're yeah. living the life that i <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. because you're when it comes to it you're not leaving your jobs and you're not leaving your nice house yeah. you know like it's a it's hard for us. I feel like it's hard. <laughs> yeah. no, but, that, but that's why it's not about us as individuals. It's about, and that's why, again, I always say you cannot rely on me to lead the revolution because I've got far too much to lose, which is why you have to bring in the masses. The, the, as a Black Panther Party, for example, recruited in prisons. Why? Because those are the people who have nothing to lose. And they will keep you honest. Because if you, I, I, you know, even now, like, you know, so I got, I, I'm comfortable. So I don't necessarily push it as much as I should do. But if you've got people who have nothing, they're, they're the people who will push it. And that's how we have to build organisations. And I think, particularly for black politics, but politics in general, we just kind of miss the people who are at the bottom are not there. They have no voice whatsoever. They're not part of it. And because they're not part of it, they're not pushing us to be better, I think. Well, wow, because they have sort of, in a sense, been entirely exempted. Again, I have a different lens than you but like when i like use um when i think about like uh the, the, maybe we talked about it last time because i think i may have just read it at that point or at least watched the documentary about what james baldwin said about the creation of the cl- the category of negro in mm. order to further yeah. white majority to disown their collective shadow yeah. i thought that was sort of, that was fascinating and for me it seems like even when when you sort of say tommy robinson says like well, the reason we didn't join the BNP is because our black mates weren't welcome there. Yeah. So we set up the EDL <laughs> <laughs> to be nice able to... <laughs> <laughs> so, so these black mates could be in it. Like, you know, like... um. <laughs> Like, I feel like there is a sort of a sense, uh, like, God, I don't know what, what level I'm not, I don't know if we're talking about the powerful, because there's no question that, like, you know, people like Tommy Robinson, are, like, their, their claimed constituency is the, like, the white working class or yeah. people that feel that immigration is putting pressure on them yeah. and that, that, you know, they're disillusioned with power. Everyone yeah. on, or, on all sides, it seems, yeah. are dissatisfied with the government and conventional politics, at least, now. Um, excuse me, but, like, for me, this category of the other, the excluded other, Again, like for me is beyond a racial categorization because when I sort of you know people that are homeless people that are dispossessed mm. in, in this country yeah. you know and uh, there's no question that as a whole broadly yeah. globally uh, white nations in very commas are exploiting yeah. black brown nations yeah. for resources and in, in a continuation of yeah. what began you know 500 years ago um what to to today it feels to me that the uh the 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 principles we need to be organizing around are are highly pragmatic ones about dealing with those that have the least Mm -hmm. giving a voice to the voiceless and in a sense looking beyond 
the in who issues this category i know there is an essential yeah. blackness as in t- in terms of you <laughs> yeah. like can track and <laughs> genetically witness black ancestry like yeah. in your own skin yeah. but like in a who i mean in a way i feel that like that's still accepting a category that's been issued well no because i think blackness and this is where i disagree with most of my academic colleagues the blackness and race are different things so race is a construction by Europeans, the creation of the Negro. We have no civilization, no culture, no history. We can be enslaved. And blackness is, it's their response to that, but it's a response that rejects it. It's actually, no, we're not. That's not us. Uh, blackness is important because it tells us who we are historically. It, it puts us in a group who are oppressed because of our blackness. Uh, it also puts us into a, um, a diaspora or a nation. And I think that's that's all it is, essentially, saying. And it's saying so. And then once you, once you look at where that black nation is, globally, locally, anywhere in the world, you can see we have a very particular location. So therefore, you should organize pragmatically to change it, right? I mean, that's a basic argument. It's, it's a very simple one. Mm. Um, I think, uh, to go back to the point about Tommy Robinson, I think part of the problem with the left is the left has missed out the marginalized as well. There are people, there are many people in... So what's happened over the last 40 years in the UK, in the West, has been, you know, the... Oh, I don't said underclass is a terrible way to put it. Deindustrialization, right? People lost jobs. People haven't got people are on welfare. People, you know, there's parts, huge parts of the country where white white working class or formerly working class are doing really badly. And just as with black politics, we've kind of ignored people in the ghetto. Guess what? Left and poli- left politics has ignored people there. And so this is again why people like Candace, Candace Owens or just Tommy Robinson, I put them in the same category, are dangerous because they are speaking to those people, right? But with nonsense, like just giving them crazy, crazy ideas about immigration is the problem and about this is the problem and your individual is the problem. Actually, what you need to do is educate people to understand that the state's a problem, the government's a problem, capitalism is a problem. I agree. Do you think it's that there's a... Some people think it was wrong for me to have Candice Owens on the podcast because mm-hmm. it's like giving Candice Owens a platform. Although she's got a massive platform anyway, <laughs> I would say. Um, and, and the same would go for other right-wing activists. It's like controversial mm-hmm. to like now. But, but, but what you're saying about education, like I almost feel sometimes people are afraid because those are like sometimes those arguments, because they are visceral, emotional, they're mm-hmm. shorthand, they don't rely to a point on rationalism other than the service of the individual, which is something we discussed is a sort yeah. of an easy to piece together rational idea. People feel that there's something to be gained by not communicating. What's your view it depends what your political project is right. right i mean look i believe in black radical politics i believe we need to organize and do what we need to do this does not include candace owen so i'd never i wouldn't invite her i wouldn't do it i've got nothing to say to her she's got no there's no there's nothing to be gained like i said it's like a void it's just an empty void it's like talking in a down a hole <laughs> down a hole basically you may as well go and talk to yourself outside that's oh. the level of rationality you're going to get but if you believe that that you know the way forward is through discourse and change and you know we can we can bring other people on board this <laughs> you sighed at that you, you know, sighed <laughs> even as you couldn't even finish the sentence yeah, no, without right. sighing at it, the futility <laughs> of it even as a philosophical <laughs> notion no but for, I like I'm 100% certain that there's the people who watched definitely online you're going to have a different audience because she's on there right people who yeah. kind of believe that stuff and if you believe that they can be um reach through rational debate then maybe maybe that could make a difference like i said i don't personally but why not i sometimes think uh, kindy that (coughs) there is no centralized solution that we need to have a time of sort of mass devolution a kind of confederacy Mm -hmm. of that believes in the empowerment of groups that can identify however they want to identify almost like a post nation state in Mm -hmm. a sense like that if you are like a like a sort of a islamic fundamentalist Mm -hmm. and you want to live that way okay okay. (laughs) that's cool you do that and if you sort of believe in like the black experience okay or if you believe in sort of white ethno nationalism then you can set up your but like you know but i feel like in a sense all these narratives have intersect at the point where I understand why white working class people are dissatisfied. I would because that's my personal social and cultural experience because like, you know, 50, 60 years ago, 
or whatever it was, white people were told, hey, Britain is amazing. Yeah. In fact, so amazing, <laughs> we'd like you to go and die <laughs> because, oh, in a foreign country for your belief, in uh, our belief in this yeah. idea. And then roll on 20, 30 years, the, yeah. the welfare state is being re repealed and rescinded. And, oh, no, yeah, no, don't worry about that English-British thing yeah. anymore. That's not real. That's yeah, just yeah, a thing we yeah. told you. So those people were bloody yeah. antagonised yeah. and have been exploited by the powerful uh, the, you know like what you're saying about the sort of the global black experience one would imagine uh, a paradigmatically could mm -hmm. be applied to Muslim nations that are being colonial and co uh, exploited yeah. co corporately and mm, young Muslims or mm -hmm. Muslims in general yeah. in this country yeah. you know that so in a sense one thing that feels universal at mm -hmm. least to me is that there are powerful people for whom these systems yeah. in are entirely beneficial mm -hmm. and that's why there is an appetite and a, a many many power structures to support and yeah. to maintain them and negatively impacted by that are members of the working, working class muslims mm -hmm. black people women yeah. homosexuals like you know anyone yeah. that's not like you know now of course that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as you know powerful black people that are members of elite or mm -hmm. powerful muslims or powerful yeah. women or powerful gay people but taken as a general thing you know there is a there are hierarchies and yeah. those hierarchies have historically been built along the lines that i've yeah. described and to mm -hmm. a degree your, your argument at least mm -hmm. from your perspective as a black person is that they continue to exist yeah so the question is how do you end it right i mean that and that's the question and that's where the individual has no role right because it's collectives uh, the, what is power power is the ability to mold collectives right the people what's the west built on one they go and kill millions of people in the that's power right you literally kill tens of millions of people in natives in the americas and the caribbean and enslave 100 million people um even if you look at the power to open a factory and get people to work for nothing you know power is the exercise of the collective for your own good and the only way to end that is to e exercise the collective for other good right and so the question we have to ask ourselves is how do we mo what's the best route to mobilize collectives i'd say that blackness has that it has it has what historically it has um there's a material basis to it there's a spiritual basis to it there's a pragmatic basis to it so for example if long term if you look what's what's the end game of black radicalism it is this unity across the african continent a revolutionary version of pan-africanism um and if that happens that ends capitalism literally ends cap capitalism can only survive partly because it exploits the wealth it literally just takes things out of the ground in the congo etc etc so if you had this african revolution even though it's a black thing specifically, it ends capitalism. So then you have to actually change everything. Mm. So what you need to do, that's that's why we should be focusing on these yeah. kind of politics. Right? So if Africa as a continent ended its current economic relationships with the uh, economic and bureaucratic organisations that have replaced mm. the colonies, that would mean that the structures that are held up by those mm. relationships would collapse. And just automatically, like, you couldn't, you can't, like, there's two things which capitalism has always depended on. One is resources and two is labor. Africa is about resources. Africa has the, is the richest continent in the entire, on the entire planet. And it's the resources from Africa, which is, and China's getting involved now as well, which is propping up in Western capitalism. So if you had an African revolution that said, no, you have to pay a proper price for those resources, that ends capitalism for everybody, not just for us, for everybody. But an African revolution, I've just been meaning to ask you for a little bit, but it keeps going up my head. Like, is it possible to conceive of a pre-colonial Africa? Because, like, mm. you know, I've heard you say or I've read you that you've written uh, that that it, even conflict within tribal conflict mm. within Africa is a legacy of yeah. colonialism. Mm -hmm. Do you think that? There is the possibility for a for African, you or probably do because that's what you're writing about. But that's that's <laughs> you, you think that's possible, like a unified African continent, a, rev, a revolutionary. Africa. Yeah, why, why not? Like it should be possible. Right? You say like you're not I gaining mean, anything from this system. No, Come yeah, on. I mean, and the grassroots in Africa understand a hundred percent. I mean, why is it you have Boko Haram and Al Shabaab people joining um, Islamic extremism? It's not because they're Muslim or they believe in this stuff. It's because where else are they going to go, right? Right, like, this just, represents it, the it, mood. Just, yeah, there's just... Anchor, yeah, exactly. violence, fuck this. <laughs> yeah, there's somebody in there fight, <laughs> fighting against the West, right? So, yeah. And those people before would have been in revolutionary movements. So I have the appetite. People, people aren't stupid. They know what their problems are, generally. And But 
I, for one thing I would caution against is to say that the solution to our problems is pre-colonial Africa. That's like 500 years yeah, ago. Like, that's, just, can we that's conceive we, of that? We've moved on. Like, things, times have changed. Like, we don't need to, there's no, it wasn't perfect in Africa before. Um, and it was, it was a long time ago. So when we're thinking about where we go forward, it has to be what do we do forward, right? Like, what does the African unity look like in the future? And actually some of the things, and this is where you have some of the tensions. So tribe, which is probably more like nation or ethnicity, um, is definitely something which is overplayed by the West, like massively. It's a way to, to they racialized the differences and they made mm. it like, you know, pitted people against each other. And if you look at like Rwanda and that genocide, that's a colonial production. Yeah, right? those categories were created. Yeah, completely. I mean, I mean, so the categories exist before, but they're kind of put on steroids and racialized and, Mm. Point material differences, right? So the Hutus get more, the, sorry, the Tutsis get more power than the Hutus, and it, it becomes biblical. And it's all, it's all kind of put on steroids. But the issue of tribe itself, or nation, if you want to call it that, um, is something which is not incompatible with this kind of revolutionary pan Africanism, but does mean something that we need to change, right? You quite, the whole unifying the whole continent means unifying the whole continent. Oh, so then it, it does mean an evolution. We're not talking about saying, look, there's this perfect Africa that was. Maybe some elements of that, but actually, what Africa looks like in the future will be very different. There's far more people, there'll be far more technology, etc. Yeah. etc. So, it's not there's no platform for this in the, in the past. I get you. It's like you cr cr want to create an ideology that is not being harvested from a pre existing white ideology mm. that has stitched into it uh, oppression. And like, I read this Native American activist, I think his name might have been Russell Mead who said like there's a assumption by your like you know that we the native american people should all become marxists <laughs> yeah, like yeah. because like that would be the best tool for us <laughs> but he goes we don't i don't believe in that he goes <laughs> for me he says Mar capitalism and communism are opposite sides of the same coin mm -hmm. both assume the earth to be resources both yeah. assume economic solutions both yeah. assume post industrial or industrialization yeah, yeah, yeah. and like he then like the rest of his uh, speech was about essentially a kind of what do I want to say a pantheonism of mm -hmm. kind of a love of earth and a yeah. love of nature mm -hmm. and a, a kind of a harmonic idea of man mm -hmm. as part of nature like so you say like you know whilst you particularly are allied you know and from ultimately Africa like you uh, don't see it as uh, uh, impossible that there would be an allegiance between, like, say, Native uh, American mm. people, Latin and South American. You know, there's no such thing as Latin America, <laughs> is it? That's a, you're a colonial <laughs> product in itself. Yeah. But like, uh, but like, you know, that there is an elite, a natural allegiance mm. here. So then, in a sense, what I feel like is that that eventually, like, I feel like the colonization in terms of the sort of s the stealing of labor and slavery. Yeah. It only happens with like right we've run out of serfs and peasants yeah. and white people to fuck <laughs> over let's go go and yeah, get yeah. some new ones you know or like now yeah. these ones are organizing collectivizing yeah. and starting to demand mm. rights so at genesis i feel like uh, that um white people mm. are, have the same ultimate problems perhaps not within a system yeah. you, you know you're pretty because mm. there are advantages that i have as a white person in this yeah. particular system that you don't have but like uh you it, it, from a utopian perspective and why would we have another one like the, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, we we have the same aim we have the same aim to dismantle existing power structures and to bring power as close to the people that are affected by it as possible to democratize power mm -hmm. to for people to be self-determining and if that you say no i want that to be my blackness to be yeah. part of that it's like oh yeah all right cool <laughs> like, <laughs> no, we, we want our like uh yeah, celticness yeah. to be part <laughs> of it all right cool no, our yeah. arabness yeah fine <laughs> but the problem the, the problem is that this is a, a problem for us now we're here as well is that actually if you look at the oppression that has been meted out to those who are black and brown outside of europe it is of a completely different order it's genocide it's slavery it's death on a scale which didn't do this they didn't they didn't, they didn't genocide they didn't go into the, the mill towns and just kill people or enslave like the people. irish feel that they no, I mean, get the that irish got the irish got it pretty bad for a bit and then became white right the, the, the irish you did just fine. White <laughs> oh. <laughs> but if you actually look at the things with the worst oppression has always been even with the irish the worst oppression was was reserved for people outside of europe always and what capitalism what 
the West is, if, if you like, it's a, it's a system which has taken its wealth and, it, and, its, and its massive abundance of wealth, uh, taken it into Europe and the West. And what we have, what we're basically having discussion on the left and the right is how do we share up those, how do we share those spoils better, right? So social democracy is, well, you know, let's equalize it out, tax the rich, let's, let's make it better for others. But it does never come to the issue of what, actually, where do we get this wealth in the first place? And that's a different level of question. Yes, it is. It's a hard level of question because you know that, just say Jeremy Corbyn, you know that he ain't happy being part of that Queen's Privy Council <laughs> and turning up to those things. He ain't going to say, let's get rid of the monarchy. No one, <laughs> no one wants How to do that. There? No, the best you're going to get from Corbyn is some more taxes, which is good. I don't think you shouldn't, but that doesn't deal with the problem of global inequality. Look at Labour's... Labour on international development is basically the same as the Tories on international development. Once we have an entrenched identity as a nation, mm -hmm. then people won't care about global inequality. We find it hard to see that far. So you're saying that this idea of a global black identity or mm -hmm. black unity has built into it post-nationalist identity, post-colonial. Like, yeah, it's like it look at yourself as fuck it, you're the nation <laughs> that you grew up in. You are this. You yeah. are your blackness. You are your heritage. That's what he's always been. To quote Malcolm again, we actually been. I've been speaking a long time and I haven't quoted him too much, so I'm, I'm proud. This is he's my... come up three times. <laughs> okay, which is I've got a Ma <laughs> Malcolm Exometer here. It's actually a drinking game. If you hear, to hear me speaking, I'm, when I mention Malcolm, drink it's usually a bad. <laughs> well, I don't think he'd like that. <laughs> you better be drinking a non-alcoholic drink. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what do you say? You're not an American. You're an African in America, right? That's a fundamental principle of black, black radicalism. But don't you think, <laughs> though? In a sense, I think you're picking up the argument at a certain point. Don't you think that, like, I could say, well, I ain't bloody English either, because, really? like, you know, I am some essential piece of consciousness temporarily <laughs> inhabiting a material body, <laughs> and my allegiance is to love and togetherness and the freedom of all people. Okay, within <laughs> within Britain, right? <laughs> I like it. You won't know this necessarily listening, but Kanye sort of participated in a TV pilot I've done once, like Ooh. because it was a limited amount of time, like TV. <laughs> programs are i kept turning to kai hindi for like simple conclusion so look so doesn't this mean that muslims and uh, work class work can all get along as well and kind of go no i don't think it means that <laughs> come on we've got to go to a break say something upbeat about how everyone's gonna get on fine no we're not no, no we're not gonna no. get on fine it's gonna be difficult it's possible but i i, I do think there's a um there's an issue what well, actually one of my issues with the black britishness thing there's a whole if you look at the last year and a half, of those two years, there's been a big push on, you know, being black and British. Is it? And yeah, on the TV, BBC have done TV stuff about it. They're even publishing black books about it. Like, Is that a reaction to wind rushy stuff or what's going on? I think it's even before then. I think there's, I think one of the, one of the responses, and I'm not saying this is like a puppet master makes these responses, but one of the kind of organic responses when you have protests, so Black Lives Matter emerges and there's kind of this idea that things aren't okay again mm. one of the always responses is to kind of incorporate people right, right. Incorporate more. and i think this black britishness is one of those incorporation projects and again mm. i know a lot of people call themselves black british and i understand it so i'm not saying it's a bad thing but i'm saying we have to caution about it because what what is that saying when you say that right there is this argument very clearly look that when you take ignore the nation state for example because the nation state prevents how we understand britain so my dad for example and my grandmother only come I've only been in Britain for like a few decades but my family was all in, in Jamaica which was part of Britain up until very recently so actually everything that happened in Jamaica was in Britain so when this idea that I'm supposed to be thankful to white British people for the war effort well all my family black and white have been in the war effort mm. all my family for generations have been supporting Britain equally important to British development as anything that happened on this island so there is this argument to say yeah I'm more British than you right because we've all been part of the, the empire but I'm not sure where that gets you politically, right? Um, mm. I can say I built a slave plantation. Does that mean I want to be the master? Like, Britain doesn't work for us. Britain has always oppressed us, always. And actually, Windrush just shows you how it's always oppressed us. And so I think part of what we need to, to be critical about is why are we claiming to be part of something which is anti ourselves? Why would anybody, though? Why would anybody, except for those that are benefiting most, which could include me now, I'm definitely part of an <laughs> economic elite nowadays, but like... Uh, why would anybody claim adherence to it? Like a system that is ultimately tyrannizing. And whilst I can't claim that my ancestors mm. were taken from their homeland, exploited, killed, etc., I feel that the same, that, that comparable arguments, we're talking about degree as opposed mm. to essence. Yeah. It, like, I suppose what I, I guess what I suppose, like when I'm talking with you, 
what I am trying to achieve is alliance, alliance of a common human experience. But given that your essential message is that there is a thing that is called blackness that mm-hmm. is distinct, yeah. that means it's hard. And that, but that, but in a way, like Peter, like the LGBTQ. Uh, TQ movement itself is like you know like that has had a great deal of success. It like requires the embrace of a separateness, and similarly though as uh, like you know once incorporated and celebrated as part of the mainstream is somewhat diffused. Yeah. But mm. I mean, I think I'm not against alliances. Alliances are important. And I think definitely if you look at Latin America, it's not Latin America, um, Asia. Although it, there's lots of many people who suffer from the victims of racism. It's not just black people. Um, and even if you look at some of the people like uh, Franz Fanon, Claudia Jones, the mar- black Marxists have always kind of said the poor working white, working class whites, they're part of our project. Um, I think the difference is that, so there's a, there's a book, Fanon writes The Wretched of the Earth, and he talks about the, the white working class as the sleeping beauty of history. When will they wake up and join the revolution? Uh-huh. What I'm arguing is that we can't wait for you to wake up. We need to do what needs to be done. And I don't believe that those alliances will be formed until they have to be formed. I think that's when you're going to get the true alliance. Hmm. Yeah, through necessity. <laughs> to localize and simplify possibly this conversation a little. What do you think about um, Raheem Sterling? Have you looked at that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's good that somebody, a sports star, a black British sports star has, has spoken out because that does not happen, particularly when they're like famous um, and at the time. So maybe you get a couple mm. of people saying stuff like when they're retired. In fact, one of the things that strikes me about, about Britishness is it's actually harder to talk about race here than it is in America. So in America, you've got the the anthem protests, you've got all these sports stars saying that this, this race is against Trump, etc. And in Britain, you've got basically nothing like Raheem Sterling. That's about it, right? Uh, because in many ways, Britain, even though it seems like America has... It'll be hard in America because, you know, they always have the anthem and they always have the flag and it's all like, that's because their country's so young, this kind of like a mechanical solidarity. They just kind of like, it's enforced, it's imposed. It's not yeah. really that certain. Whereas here, you don't need the anthem, you don't need the flag, but it's so embedded in this, in this you just don't do it. I, I think I commend Raheem massively because it's just not something that people do. It's almost career suicide. What I like as well is that he didn't stop at the point <laughs> of saying that's out of order what them Chelsea fans said he went as far as to say it is this is sanctioned by the way that the media report on black footballers as opposed to white footballers and provided an example i I would like (laughs) to know that's pretty good bit of critical (laughs) theory that he presented (laughs) there and media (laughs) analysis also, though, what occurs is that I think he's been signed by Nike <laughs> subsequent <laughs> to that. So that, that energy is going to go into people. I'm going to buy those shoes. Where were they made? Who made them? Exactly. This reinforces the problem, right? But yeah, it's better than nothing. Just because it's radical, it doesn't mean it's bad. Not radical. Because it's not radical doesn't mean it's a bad idea, right? That's wicked. Thanks, Kahindi. Thanks for your time. We've been talking for 75 minutes. Okay. It's not as long as I uh, talked to uh, Candice <laughs> yeah, Owens, but frankly, you're not as beautiful as you can. Yeah, that was a, what an amazing person. It's, yeah. uh, it's really lovely to talk to you. I always feel educated and I always feel that you bring to mind ideas that are, whilst political as opposed to spiritual, have a similar quality in that mm-hmm. there is something difficult to grasp because they are outside the framework of permitted discourse. So that is most valuable. Thank thank you. you Thank you. Cheers.